Uh, myxomas uh, clinically can always be a differential diagnosis for valvular heart disease, um, especially mitral stenosis. Two reasons being its progression is gradual, just like mitral stenosis, it does not occur on a certain single day. And the second thing is because of its location. Um, in the four chambered view of the heart, if you have the mitral valve there, the tricuspid valve there, and if there is a large myxoma here occupying the left atrium, if it is sessile, then it has a little less likelihood, like I have drawn, it has a less likelihood to behave um, like mitral stenosis, but that still can behave as mitral stenosis if it starts to come in the path of the left. Uh, atrial to ventricular inflow. But more often than not, this tumor is uh, pedunculated and so it moves like a ball valve, th uh, valve thrombus. So, it has some intrinsic mobility and it can actually move towards the mitral valve and cause a functional mitral stenosis even though the valves are normal. And that is why the presentation can be gradual in the form of dyspnea on exertion gradually progressing over time or they can be completely asymptomatic which again is also possible in uh, mitral stenosis also. Uh, they can have uh, prodromal symptoms like fever associated with arthralgias and myalgias, they can have cough and they can have generalized cachexia uh, sometimes related to uh, something like a paraneoplastic uh, manifestation or sometimes related to reduced cardiac output and decreased activities. It can also present with erythematous rash, clubbing and cyanosis and Raynaud's phenomenon. Now, clubbing and cyanosis becomes a differential diagnosis for three important uh, diseases in cardiology. Uh, the one being infective endocarditis, the second being congenital cyanotic heart disease and third being atrial myxomas. In many lists, sometimes atrial myxomas will be skipped off. So, this must be in your differential diagnosis for the cardiac causes of clubbing. So, infective endocarditis is definitely uh, a cause, congenital cyanotic, cyanotic heart disease is a cause and atrial myxomas is the third commonest cause for uh, cardiac causes of clubbing. And um, only the latter two that is the congenital cyanotic heart disease and atrial myxomas can have both clubbing and cyanosis. An elevated uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, uh, C-reactive protein and gamma globulin, anyway they are there in multiple conditions, so they are not very specific, but they are common. When it comes to the blood workup, we have something interesting, you, the, it is usually associated with leukocytosis, that is fine, but if the question is asked uh, regarding platelets and RBCs, you should be careful because they can have both. Um, elevated or decreased counts of platelets. They can have both anemia or polycythemia. So, the MCQ could actually be drafted as which of this is um, not a manifestation of atrial myxomas on uh, uh, CBC. And if anemia and polycythemia are given, you, the, you usually get to think that, okay, one of this must be the wrong answer. But actually, both of them are correct because both can occur in make so much, you can have anemia or polycythemia, you can have elevated or decreased platelet counts, but they have not mentioned leukopenia. It is usually, when it comes to the white blood cell count, it is usually only leukocytosis. Uh, this is interesting. This is one example um, for even in your clinical vivas, if they ask you one cause for trepopnea. Now, trepopnea is dyspnea on lying to one side for example, their left lateral position. So, uh, we have orthopnea, which is dyspnea on lying flat. We have platypnea, which is dyspnea on lie, sitting up and which we, and there is trepopnea, which is uh, dyspnea on lying to one side. Any positional symptoms, be it trepopnea, the patient describing uh, dyspnea or on any particular uh, position can be, uh, should, uh, you know, raise a flag in your mind to think that it is probably a manifestation of uh, a mobile mass in the heart, be it a tumor uh, behaving like a ball valve tumor or a myxoma in the left atrium, either of them can have positional symptoms due to gravity. Uh, syncope 
if the patient manifests with syncope, it means that the myxoma is probably already large one and decreasing the cardiac output or it could also mean that the patient has had something like a transient ischemic attack or a stroke um, or a, a forewarning that there is there are emboli already dis dispersed and there is a chance of recurrent emboli. So, syncope is a dangerous uh, warning sign when the patient has myxoma. Pulmonary edema is just like uh, how a mitral stenosis patient presents with pulmonary edema, so also because of elevated left atrial pressure, the patient can have pulmonary edema. Now, emboli. Emboli in myxomas can be of multiple types. They could either be peripheral emboli causing uh, acute limb ischemia. They can cause stroke if it is cerebral. They can cause sudden cardiac death or myocardial infarction and they can have uh, other peripheral emboli including mesenteric and other manifestations. So, emboli, the, any um, uh, presentation, it is unlikely that the patient will have multiple um, uh, types of presentation on the same day. So, any one of these manifesting which is unexplained uh, should encourage us to look for a possibility of a cardiac myxoma. Because of the presence in the left atrium 80 percent of the time, um, it presents something like mitral stenosis. as I said, it can also present something like mitral regurgitation. So, that is a tricuspid intraatrial septum, your mitral valve. Depending on how the tumor reacts, um, interacts with the mitral valve, the patient either has something like mitral stenosis or regurgitation. Like we already discussed, if the tumor interacts, uh, does not allow uh, the valve to open sufficiently because of its presence there in the left atrium, it manifests as mitral stenosis. If the tumor comes in contact with the mitral leaflet and does not allow the leaflets to coapt during systole, then it can cause actually mitral regurgitation as well. So, because of the physical uh, impedance to the mitral valve during its closure, during systole, uh, the mitral valve may not completely be able to coapt, leaving an orifice through which there can be mitral regurgitation. So, mitral stenosis as well as mitral regurgitation like presentations are possible in myxomas. Now, very often it is described that it resembles mitral stenosis and you will hear this very commonly in uh, clinical teaching. It should not uh, close your mind off to think that there is a possibility of mitral regurgitation like presentation or an actual mitral regurgitation occurring in the heart because of the physical presence of the myxoma. If it is ventricular, uh, which is rare, and but it is more common if it is familial, it can be uh, cause either obstruction to sub aortic outflow or the pulmonic outflow. So, that kind of uh, presentation is rather rare. It is more common in familial myxomas and they are more catastrophic because any sort of emboli are usually going to be much larger in nature because the orifice, the sub aortic and the sub pulmonic orifices are relatively smaller. So, any size tumor can cause much greater catastrophes. Uh, we will next deal with the auscultatory findings. What is important that on careful auscultation, two thirds of patients can have some auscultatory finding. So, although it is uh, in a large number of patients, it is asymptomatic or symptomatic only by dyspnea on exertion. On careful auscultation, up to two thirds of patients can actually be detected, but it is to be looked for very carefully. 50% uh, of people can have a systolic murmur. This systolic murmur can be either due to mitral regurgitation like we mentioned earlier or a left ventricle outflow tract murmur um, if there is obstruction to uh, blood flow across the LVOT uh, into the aortic valve. Um, less often however, they can be a loud S1 similar to mitral stenosis. They can be an opening snap and a mid diastolic murmur. Now, these are very telltale signs of mitral stenosis, which is why again apart from the uh, history, even the clinical findings can mimic mitral stenosis a lot. Now, why do you get, why there is a chance of a loud S1? The reason is uh, during uh, diastole, blood flows from the left atrium into the left ventricle. In the normal heart, as uh, the mitral valve opens and when systole approaches, before systole sets in itself, because of the elevated left ventricle and diastolic pressure, the valves start to float up towards the left atrium and in systole, the valves produce S1. Now, in mitral stenosis, the valvular mitral stenosis, the valves remain open for a very long period until the end of diastole because the pressure in the left atrium is always higher, keeps it open so that in the next systole, the excursion of the valve tips 
from here till they close is much greater and because it comes through a longer path it has a longer excursion you have a louder s1 so that is the typical mechanism of the loud s1 in a non calcified mitral stenosis the similar thing happens here if the uh, tumor mass is uh, large enough to impede with the valve closing it will um, amount to a functional mitral stenosis again when this closes this will open which will remain open till the end of diastole because of the elevated left atrial pressure and that is why you have a loud s1 opening snap again the same mechanism as we disc actually all these things we have discussed at great detail in uh, our earlier uh, sessions um, but i just thought it deserves um, a repeat here because you should know the mechanism why you get a loud s1 an opening snap mdm is essentially just like because there is elevated left atrial pressure and uh, it is similar to mitral stenosis a tumor plop tumor plop is an exclusive finding to uh, atrial myxoma uh, or any left atrial tumor um, in your actual clinical uh, presentations it will be prudent for you just to present it as uh, a diastolic sound uh, you can say that uh, i am able to appreciate a diastolic sound because saying tumor plop is essentially almost a pathological diagnosis which cannot be um, uh, so sure on clinical examination so hearing a diastolic sound and appreciating its uh, quality uh, and trying to differentiate it from an s3 or an s4 um, or a pericardial knock or such as the diastolic sounds and presenting a finding as a diastolic sound is good enough from a clinical point of view it is heard in about 15 percent of cases only so if you are unable to appreciate one also it is okay it is a relatively uh, low pitched sound early to mid diastole um, it can be due to the tumor impact against the valve or the ventricle the tumor itself moving and the differential diagnosis would be an opening snap or a third heart sound now how to differentiate each of this we have a table a little later in the presentation how you differentiate each of the diastolic sounds um, this also becomes important not only from your mcq point of view but also from your uh, clinical uh, examination and your viva point of view when it comes to the ECG, uh, you should read this properly. It is not non-specific ECG changes, but actually it is written no specific ECG changes. So, you can have an absolutely normal ECG as well. Sometimes if they have significant left atrial enlargement, changes in the P wave can be observed. If there are coexisting uh, pathologies in the heart, those signs could be seen on the ECG, but per se ECG can be actually normal. They need not be any specific ECG change. Uh, the x-ray has a non-specific chest x-ray in other words they could be cardiomegaly which could be due to various causes left atrial enlargement due to can be due to mitral stenosis mitral regurgitation and this tumor as well they could be a calcified tumor which is rather rare but in the pathologic description we notice that they could have calcifications so calcifications in the chest x-ray in the region of the left atrium for that you should know where to look for if you have the uh, chest like that and if you have the uh, cardiac silhouette in the chest x-ray like that the left atrium usually occupies this region it is posterior in the three-dimensional understanding of the heart the left atrium is a posterior structure but that on a chest x-ray that is where you will see it so any calcifications noted specs or you know patchy calcifications uh, extensively could be a sign of a left atrial myxoma it is a little difficult to pick up because it has to be a precisely exposed film and uh, other soft tissues also should be seen well uh, to contrast with the calcifications um, they could actually have a pulmonary edema like picture and then the x-ray will look something like that of congestive cardiac failure on the echo ct and mri on the standard modes of cardiac imaging uh, the myxoma will obviously be picked up uh, pretty easily very comfortably and straightforward doesn't require too much um, of a modified view or something like that but nevertheless uh, what becomes important is planning for surgery so the diagnosis of a myxoma on the echo gets no brownie points what matters is delineating whether it is a sessile myxoma where is its stock which part of the interior septum so that we can help advise the surgeon what to expect uh, when uh, excision is actually planned uh, the differential diagnosis for myxomas depending on their size and location could be infective endocarditis other uh, collagen vascular diseases or connective tissue disorders and some other paraneoplastic syndromes because their uh, presenting uh, signs could be uh, quite variable